Good evening. It's 1800 hours. My name is Scott Galloway, NYU Stern School of Business, uh, Professor of Marketing. Thanks for joining us tonight in our town hall, if you will, talking about the future of higher education. We're going to bust into it with some slides attempting to encapsulate some of the activity around higher ed and why uh, we here believe that it is ripe for disruption. And then we're going to move straight into your questions. And joining me to help round out or br uh, bring some real domain expertise is our esteemed panel in order. Anastasia Crosswhite is a friend and the former associate dean at NYU Stern School of Business. And she's a core member of the education and nonprofit practice at Spencer Stewart, a leading global executive search and leadership consulting firm, and has a lot of domain expertise around leadership and what's happening across higher ed. Zakia Smith Ellis serves as chief policy advisor to New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy where she's responsible for developing and directing the governor's policy initiatives in coordination with the cabinet. Previously, she served as New Jersey's Secretary of Higher Education, responsible for policy development and coordination in the state. Prior to that work in New Jersey, Zakia worked at the, in the Obama administration as a senior advisor for education at the White House Domestic Policy Council and as a senior advisor at the U.S. Department of Education. And finally, Bob Shireman is the Director of Higher Ed Excellence and a Senior Fellow at the Century Foundation working on education policy with a focus on affordability, quality assurance, and consumer protection. Bob founded the Institute for College Access and Success in 2004 and in 11, 2011 launched the policy organization California Com Completes. He also served in the Clinton White House as a senior policy advisor to the National Economic Council and in the Obama administration as deputy undersecretary of education. Okay, let's light this candle. Let's try and get through uh, way too many slides in around 10 or 12 minutes. Uh, 3,000 people registered. Uh, welcome. It's a mix of parents, students, and most likely tenured professors who are going to tell me I'm wrong and that I'm not helping. Anyways, the current situation. Higher ed, uh, we are really good when I say we Americans at software, weapons, media, and universities. We tend to dominate from at least a brand equity standpoint consistently the list of the world's top universities. However, we have a problem. These universities have become the university system, which used to be the upward lubricant for the middle class in America, has, has slowly become the caste system, where the top 1% uh, or kids from top 1% income earning households are 77 times more likely to attend an Ivy or an Ivy Plus institution, which is essentially an elite institution, than those from the poorest quintile. Uh, you could argue that at 64,000 students total, the Ivy League is uh, not really a higher education institution, but a luxury brand or a hedge fund that educates the kids of their investors. Florida State at 75,000 students, Ohio State at 55,000. The Ivy is really more spectacle than historic. It's our public schools that kind of determine where America does or doesn't get traction. As you can see, uh, we do have a caste system, kind of where you're born is more important or a larger indicator of where you're gonna end up in school in terms of the wealth of that household. Uh, we also see incredible bloat across uh, universities. I'm picking on the University of California system, my alma mater here, but we have seen just an explosion in costs across administration uh, uh, in higher ed. At the same time, we've seen a flattening or even a decline in many states of state and federal funding being afforded to institutions. And we've, as a result, are seen in it just an absolute explosion in the cost of education. Typically spring is a nervous but joyous time. And uh, our thesis is that it's become um, a season of despair and real financial insecurity for households as their kids don't get into the school they wanted and get downgraded and end up in an ugly conversation around whether they can afford to spend the price of a Mercedes on what has become increasingly a Hyundai certification. So now that we are moving to all online, and I believe increasingly every day more universities are going to announce they're going online because we have figured out that our super spreaders are uh, young people and that uh, I'd like to think that people who run these universities are smart enough to realize they don't want to be the nursing homes and the cruise ships of the next stage of this pandemic. And once those tuition cashes, tuition checks cash, I believe they will become increasingly practical around announcing they are going all remote. And I believe we're already starting to see that. Once we're all remote, a snarky way of looking at this is that a streaming video platform spends billions of dollars to develop original, original IP and content that they stream over broadband. So effectively, when we're all remote, we have the most expensive streaming video platform, which is Harvard at 50,000 bucks a year. So 
We have, um, there's a lot, we have got some pushback around the sticker price is a bit misleading because some of the better universities, actually the net tuition has gone down, which again kind of indicates income inequality because the top universities uh, tend to attract students or the best students. And obviously these students are paying less than just good kids versus remarkable kids. But we've still seen just an extraordinary increase in the cost of education. And for those of you who aren't following along on YouTube, these slides will be made available. We've also seen stagnant uh, growth in terms of the number of seats being offered. So it's not as if all of this additional tuition is expanding the offering or the opportunity across the US, it's not. And we've also seen enrollments uh, peak up a little bit, but start to decline again. Uh, I will say the University of California has increased its enrollment about 34% in the last 22 years. So I, I don't wanna make blanket statements or too many blanket statements, I'm making a few of them, but some have not lost the script and are sticking to their original mission of expanding opportunity across their populace. So we have seen, again, some universities, again, you see increase their enrollment relative to enrollment across the US, but we've seen admission rates plummet. I did some data here. I applied to UCLA in 1982. The admissions rates were 63%. Now the admission rates are 12%, which means that UCLA no longer has the latitude to admit the unremarkable sons of single immigrant mothers who lived and died secretaries, yours truly, and can only accept really two types of people. One, the children of rich kids who can afford the test prep industrial complex, tutors, have the right people, know somebody with their name on the side of a building. And the second cohort, what I would refer to as freakishly remarkable 15 to 17 year olds. We are admitting the top 1%. We're doubling down on them. But the question is, um, or what I think we need to acknowledge, and I can prove this mathematically, is 99% of us and 99% of our children are not in the top 1%. And is that who we want to, to divide all the spoils here? And as you can see, tuition has absolutely exploded. Uh, this persists across states, across almost every public system in the, in, um, the US. The Chin that has been stuck out here, I mean, simply put, when you raise prices faster than inflation with no underlying increase in productivity, go into an Apple store, buy a Mercedes, even go into an emergency room, it doesn't look like 1980, go into almost any university classroom, and it would be difficult to tell whether the number one show on TV is Seinfeld or, I don't know, whatever it is now. But the, things haven't changed a whole hell of a lot. What's changed is the tuition. Uh, we're seeing some online growth, but uh, our belief is that there's going to be tremendous disruption sponsored by venture capitalists whose green glands are going as they see a huge opportunity to come in and take advantage of this excess margin. And as parents and consumers and students get more comfortable with remote learning, we're going to see a massive investment and a, a narrowing of the delta between offline and online offerings. And also, it's not binary. We think the majority of higher education institutions will end up at a hybrid model. So we're seeing an accelerant plans for the summer uh, it looks like almost half are going to be in some sort of hybrid or all online i think that goes to three quarters in the next two to three weeks and we're seeing a tremendous amount of increase in search or inquiries queries around uh, people interested in online learning uh, so we got in a ton of trouble here uh, we decided to try and quantify this and tried to come up with an index and then plot that index and who thrives survives struggles and is challenged we came up with two axes uh, what institutions are vulnerable and then who offers low value to high value now just to go through our methodology and this data sheet is available to anybody who wants it online we saw value as a function of your credential or the credential of the university i think that's the primary reason people go to school quite frankly the experience, and then their education. We measured the credential by the school rank, the search volume, the admin rate, high admin rate is bad in terms of brand equity, the experience as rated by niche, and the education we assess based on the 15 and 30 year net present value, uh, and also the instructional spend per student. And then we took that, we times each of those three factors or multiplied by each of those three factors and then divided it by tuition to come up with a value score. In terms of vulnerability, we look at the endowment per full-time student. Large endowments give you some cushion to survive this or any other exogenous impact. And then the percent of international students. That has typically been a feature. It's turned into a bug. A lot of universities claim that they let in international students for diversity. I think that's bullshit. We let in international students because they pay full freight. We could increase our diversity at universities if we let in more low-income Americans. 
I find that the international students at NYU are strikingly homogenous. They're essentially the kids of the richest people in that given nation. So let's look at some of these, let's look at some of these uh, schools that we scored. UNC, we saw as thriving, very high credential, very prestigious college, fantastic student experience uh, that pays off in terms of your income earning potential post post-graduation and also a fairly low tuition, a decent endowment and international students. And by the way, I don't, I'm not biased against international students. I just think at this point, you're having more international students is a vulnerability. Uh, international students are probably not going to show up, I would imagine, because of the xenophobic tropes coming out of the White House. And just a general acknowledgement that the U.S. is, a, is kind of a, on fire right now. And so when you're paying full freight, to go to a hotel that is virus ridden and the manager of the hotel is racist, you might decide just to stick at home for a semester, a year. And I think we're already seeing that. Uh, Purdue, we had is um, survive, and that is a decent credential, good experience, decent MPV scores, um, uh, uh, good value in terms of tuition, but a relatively, relatively modest uh, uh, endowment and also a decent amount or um, of vulnerability around higher than average international students. Struggle, low value, low vulnerability, meaning not a great degree, but pretty bulletproof. A uh, school like Randolph, fairly low rank, uh, very mediocre student experience, decent, not great, uh, MPV, and then uh, expensive. So sort of bad, but expensive as a value proposition to the end consumer. But at the same time, very strong endowment, which means they have a lot of cushion, a very engaged alumni, and can survive uh, something like this. Sarah Lawrence is an example of a school that we feel is in real trouble. Um, uh, just an okay brand, very high admit rate, very uh, weak student experience, low NPV scores, and a high tuition. So expensive but bad. In addition, very little, very little cushion. We think this is the sweet spot of what is to education, what department stores are to retail, and that many of these schools may begin a death march, because you might see a water falling of the top tier schools have no problem if 10, 20% of their students decide to take a deferment or a gap year, they just reach into their huge waiting list. But this creates very strong pressure on the tier two schools, but they're still okay as they can go very deep into their waiting list. And then the tier three schools see a demand destruction of 30 to 50%. And they go into the waiting list, which they don't have. And when you have an economic model that's very high fixed costs based on immovable personnel costs and high infrastructure costs and very high gross margins, it works really well on the way up. It is, it is deathly on the way down because just 10 or 20% of your students not showing up flips your economic model upside down. I think we're uh, in, uh, experiencing what I would call the great dispersion. And that is, if you think about healthcare, 99% of people who've contracted, endured, and developed the antibodies for COVID-19 will have not entered a doctor's office, much less a hospital. And as a result, there's going to be an explosion in remote medicine and telehealth. The same thing is happening at campuses, and that is remote learning might dramatically expand the role of the campus. And if, loosely speaking, or theoretically, if 50% of classes take place online, you effectively double the size of the campus, which has traditionally been the throttle and kind of the mechanism for the cartel that has become higher education. So where do we go from here? In about three and a half weeks, I kick off my course at NYU, 400 students at $7,000 a piece or $2.8 million in revenue. My agent takes a 99% commission, but that's effectively $233,000 a night to listen to me on Zoom for two hours and 40 minutes or $583 per night per student or $1,500 a minute. There's tremendous room for innovation here. You're seeing a lot of professors start their own courses and you can do something half as good, but if it's a 10th of the price, you obviously have a 5X return in value or even if it's only a third as good, but you charge a 10th of the price, you're offering three times the value. Universities have raised their prices so fast that they've just created so much margin opportunity for upstarts and new companies. So we're seeing more students uh, going online and we're seeing obviously uh, the benefit from that is lower costs to deliver. Uh, I think the future is gonna involve some sort of hybrid. I apologize, I'm going fast, but I wanna get through this. And I'd like to think the silver lining here, and I was on a call this morning with the chancellors of Berkeley and UCLA and one of the regents I think there's opportunity for a grand bargain where hopefully we can get government to fall back in love 
with universities and in exchange for dramatically decreasing the cost per student of education through the use of mix, the mixed use of big and small tech, we could lower the cost. But at the same time, if we could get increased funding from governments and from alumni, we might be able to dramatically increase enrollments. There's this nonsense that this will dilute the brands. Almost every major university in the, tier, in the top tier, whether it's Michigan, the University of North Carolina, Harvard, or UC Irvine would acknowledge that they could have doubled the number of the admits and not lost any quality across their students. We have remarkable kids who are no longer getting into great schools, no longer getting into good schools, but getting into average schools and paying the price to go to a great school. We've seen admission rates go from just uh, about 40% uh, just 20 years ago to 13 at the University of California, Los Angeles, and doubling the admissions rate would only take us back, get this, just six years. So with that, with that, we have our panel and we're gonna bust into our first question. Hi, I'm Ruvanara Simhan from Kane University. I'm a math professor and Kane is a regional public university in, here in New Jersey. My question to you is, what do you feel are the main challenges for public institutions, such as for your regional colleges and universities, as well as community colleges that serve the majority of the um, college-going population? Um, going forward, what do you see as one of their main challenges, and what is it that they can do better? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Narissaman. Uh, Zakia, any thoughts? Well, yes, love Kane University. It's one of the gems in New Jersey's uh, public higher education ecosystem. It serves a lot of low income and first generation college students. It's very diverse, one of the most diverse universities in, in the state. Having said that, they um, face challenges that are similar to a lot of public institutions, which I would say center around affordability, um, kind of similar to what's not as unaffordable as one of the, some of the slides that Scott just showed, but for the student population that they serve, really um, they struggle to pay, you know, $5,000 out of pocket. And so um, even if the net price of cane, I would venture to guess is maybe somewhere around $15,000 after all room and board and all expenses are taken into account, it's, it's a lot for a person who's um, not, not wealthy. Um, having said that, they also struggle with completion. So unfortunately, those students also need a lot of support, a lot of wraparound services, and the state doesn't provide probably as much support as they need, frankly. And that um, means that not that many students that start finish. So you've got people who are paying, they're taking out loans, and they don't complete. So you are ostensibly have a potential to be in a worse situation, which is, I would say, one of the biggest challenges of colleges um, in this category overall is that you have the potential to have students take on debt go and then not actually complete um, and have the debt but no degree. So that is a big challenge and how they can help more students actually complete their degrees while being affordable is is the, the challenge moving forward. And they can do that by trying to actually, I, I think a lot of folks don't focus on completion, they focus on rank, they focus on trying to be NYU, not saying this about Kane, but they focus on a lot of other things other than students actually completing and a lot of other priorities um, in terms of how they spend their money other than ensuring that affordability for the people who can't afford it the most. They chase international students or people who can pay rather than thinking about how to help people who can pay, pay less. Next question. Hey, Scott, Tyler D'Andrea here from Nashville, Tennessee. Simple question. Uh, what areas do you think colleges and universities should make cuts to financially? And what areas do you think they will make cuts to? Thank you very much for taking my question. Have a great day. Uh, thoughts? Yeah, you know, it really depends on the kind of college that we're talking about here in a place like Nashville. You've got uh, 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 Vanderbilt University, um, uh, for a selective private university, spends a lot of money um, and uh, probably has some bloat in administration, as Scott mentioned. Uh, but another big area is um, highly selective universities that spend money to attract, spending money to attract rich kids with high test scores, people who basically don't need financial aid instead of providing financial aid to enroll more low-income students. Uh, that brings up the issue of, of the ability or the lack of ability of colleges, selective colleges, to work together to enroll more low-income students. They end up competing in a way that is 
uh, that makes worse the stratification in, uh, in elite higher education. Uh, at the same time, Tennessee has some um, very uh, affordable public institutions, community colleges in, in the state, uh, uh, good transfer policies. And uh, I think that's something to build on. And I think we need to recognize that um, online education is not the best approach, especially for a lot of low income students who come from families without a lot of college experience where being immersed in the academic environment makes a big difference. And we need to make sure, we need to work on providing them with the opportunity to have that experience because a, uh, uh, you know, half, half as um, effective, half, half the quality is not what we want to provide them. We want to provide them 100% of the quality um, and if we can get them, if we can get Vanderbilt to enroll more low, more low income students, uh, so much the better. But let's also embrace our public institutions and provide the federal and state support so that they can continue to enroll low income students as well. Thank you, Bob. So Anastasia, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I want to put forward a thesis. Both, both of us worked at NYU. And let's what just... else is new, Scott? Always putting me on the spot. Go for it. Well, we, you no longer work there, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm close to being fired. So, uh, look, um, $190 million budget, I think I could cut $30 million in 30 days if I had the power. A CMO who does nothing but trying to track more applicants when we have a 14% admittance rate, vice chancellors of diversity and inclusion when we have the most diverse and inclusive place on the planet, and we'd be better off spending that money to support uh, households or kids of color uh, who don't have access to this type of university would make us much more diverse and inclusive. Uh, communications departments that are half a dozen strong and a third of the faculty that should be put on an ice flow that stopped being productive about 20 years ago. Um, isn't this place just rife with grotesque fat and waste? You're not going to get me to say agree with that, Scott. Um, but I will say uh, and I'm not going to talk too much about NYU in particular, but I would say, yes, there has been a growth in administration and full stop, former administrator, so you could argue as part of the problem. But I would say the challenge that a lot of universities face is they are not just a university, right? There are so many components to a big, complex place like NYU, and I do think that leads to to added services on services. Like I know NYU has had to quadruple the number of mental health administrators in the past five years. You know, that is considered administrative. So yeah. there are categories where the growth makes absolute sense. Um, you know, I also think, to be honest, as someone who worked in the Dean's office, we, are con we were constantly bombarded with requests to comment on this, write a memo on this, what's our view on that? You actually do need people in there or you are absolutely deluged. So I also think the thing that we're not talking about, but it's in, the, in, in a lot of the flow that we've been discussing, rankings. Rankings drive so much of the decision-making of a lot of universities and it drives a lot of the things that you're talking about, right? Giving financial, as Bob mentioned, giving financial aid, merit aid to students with high test scores. That is a direct correlation to wanting to move up in the rankings, yeah. right? The US News has a stranglehold on the public's perception of quality of higher education in this country. And that's a real problem. People, I know people pick that, uh, pick schools, whether they're 12 or 14, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's nuts. So once you're in that rat race, it's very hard to get out of it. And I'm not quite sure how, um, how, how, you, how you break that cycle. I know a lot of schools have talked about ignoring the rankings, but I'll tell you when you ignore the rankings, the alumni and the students come after you hard when you drop in the rankings. So big, it's not easy. Big topic, Zakia, any thoughts, cost cutting? Um, well, cost cutting, there's, I, I think, 
um, I would agree with Bob in general. A lot of institutions spend money on students that don't need to get money. Um, yep. And they may spend real money or they may spend fake money. More often they spend fake money. Right. So like they say their tuition is $60,000. They um, are going to give you a $10,000 scholarship. So you got a discount, but they actually never had $10,000 to give you. They just like wrote off the price. And so um, it's, it's a really yeah. insidious um, uh, game. They could do the same thing for a low income student, but they don't. Uh, and, and so in Anyway, it makes their financial aid have to, if they have a real grant, that real grant has to actually buy down their, their $10,000. If they had a grant from a church, that church actually had to give them $10,000 to give to the college, whereas the college could have just said, we know you're never going to be able to pay the $60,000. Guess what? Your price is really, you know, $40,000. Then you could use your real $10,000 to actually make your price $30,000 and then have a borrow less. So financial aid is just a whole other piece, but I would agree with Anastasia in terms of um, rankings and how that plays in people's minds. I think a large portion of why people might not be willing to do online or something is because they have this perception of quality that is really not rooted in any objective criteria. It's just based on how they feel about a school, which is one of the hardest things though to change because yep. it's based on like centuries of history and that's kind of the basis for the Ivy League, you know, whole existence. Um, you know, an example, and you know, you get the best and the brightest and you kind of cultivate them. But if you had to educate the students that, you know, Bronx Community College had to educate, how well would you do with them kind of thing? So it's, is it really the kind of foundation of the school and all of the resources that the school has and all of the supports and the great faculty? Or is it a function of you have really, really smart students that you've, you know, picked from the, the creme de la creme and they would probably do well if you put them in a library with nothing else versus um, what the school really has to offer. So it's, chicken and egg, um, but cost cutting certainly on the financial aid side, but I would just say generally people are paying for the perception. So it's hard to think about how you bring that cost down if that's what people are paying for. And it's a ephemeral piece that it's kind of made up. Thanks for that. Next question. Hi, Scott. My question for the panel is this. If you're at a university that is in your parish category, and you've been predicting this for quite a while now, and nothing has changed course, but you're a faculty member who does see themselves as innovative, can think about problem solving, but it is not going to be part of the systemic solution for the institution. Are there pockets, are there entrepreneurial pockets where you can still exist as an educator? Are there going to be disruptions so that there are now small, small scale educational um, offerings that can be set up by entrepreneurial faculty? Uh, what do you see as a disruption that might happen here so that individuals can actually redefine what education is? Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Jillian. Um, so my sense is if you understand technology and you understand how to shape a course and you have the initiative to reach out to the faculty or the leadership in a university and say, I'm interested in putting together a strong, you know, um, a, a retail, um, a retail oriented course and, and have the skills to figure out the technology and how to deliver the, this pedagogy online. My sense is university leadership would welcome that with open arms. And if you don't find it internally in your own institution, uh, I'm working for an online education startup right now, section four, and we're having a very difficult time finding both pro professors and course developers and technologists who understand how to deliver education online. This is, go you're going to see on almost every venture capital memo outlining their new areas of investment, you see online education. So if you're really sincere about making the investment, and it's not easy, I, I struggle with these technologies, I find it hard, it's much easier for me to walk into a classroom and just press play and go on kind of autopilot. But if you're willing to make that investment in understanding technology, and you feel you have the skills to deliver it online, my sense is university leadership is very, very open to that. Um, anyways, I'll open it there. Any, any, Bob, any thoughts on that? I, I, I agree. I, I think at a, at a parish uh, university or uh, challenged, I guess, is the new name. Um, uh, the leadership is eager for people with solutions. And um, if you can, if you can present some, uh, some ideas. I think there's a good chance they go with it, and if it's the kind of place where they're where they're challenged and they and they're not, then then I would look to go, you know, look to go somewhere else because uh, we're gonna because this, the the coming year or so, the coming months, uh, we are gonna see a lot of institutions that have been in that category 
uh, who, that are going to close. It may or may not be the one you're at, but, uh, but a lot will close. And just before I open it to Anastasia and Zakira, uh, what uh, you're, Bob is, re is referencing, in our initial quadrant, I labeled low vulner uh, high vulnerability, low value as perish. And I heard from a lot of administrators and leadership saying <laughs> something to the effect of, Scott, I'm dealing with COVID. Scott, you really don't understand the nuance of the strength of my university. And you're up there in Soho and you are not helping. And I think that was a fair criticism. And so I've asked all of them to submit uh, um, um, their comments on where we got the data wrong. We've consistently updated the data. For example, I was using out-of-state tuition to rank some on the value and they said, that's not fair. It should be a blended of out-of-state and in-state. And we even just changed the nomenclature to struggle because when, when an alumni sees the term perish, uh, it sounds as if they were freaking out and calling these overworked administrators who have a lot of moving parts right now. Uh, Anastasia, is key, any thoughts on uh, uh, Ms. Okenfeld's question? I mean, I, I have to agree with, with everything that's been said. I mean, my experience is university leadership is usually begging for professors to be entrepreneurial and to think outside the box. And, and you know, one of the silver linings of this COVID thing, and I think you and I have talked about this, Scott, you know, uh, the, the median faculty member went from online education over my dead body to I'm not stepping foot in a classroom until there's a vaccine almost within two weeks, right? So that shift alone, I think has opened a lot of professors and academics eyes to the potential of what online could be. Now to be completely clear, what most universities have been delivering the past few months is not online education. It is, you know, an emergency band-aid thrown on Zoom and other, port other you know, uh, technologies, you know, what real online education is, is very different. But I do think more and more schools, now that professors and academics are more open to even being on camera in this kind of, I think there will be more opportunities for entrepreneurial professors to try new things and see what works and, and potentially bring revenue to the, to the institution. Yeah, and I couldn't tell if she, what her question was was about how Zakira, to help. Did we me. lose you? Oh, do you hear me? I, I hear you, Zakira. Okay. Yeah, I was. Saying, I don't know if what she, her question was more so about how to help the college, which I don't know if some of these colleges can be, if they can be helped, and I'm sure they would appreciate any innovative thoughts, or that she realizes that maybe she can't help yeah. the college exist in the same way and wants to know how can she kind of make it on her own out, outside in the world. And there I would say, um, you know, the, the things that, you know, Scott is actually talking about in terms of how do you promote what you have to offer. That, that said, I think the harsh reality um, that we sometimes have to deal with is that not everybody is willing to pay for like just the pure knowledge of whatever and that the number of people who have to offer the pure knowledge of whatever is, uh-oh, we lost Scott. Uh-oh. We can keep going. Maybe. Oh, we're, wow. Now we we're in charge. Uh -oh, Go what for is it. Going on? Charge. Is this an innovative? <laughs> we just reduced the cost of delivery. <laughs> we, we, well, since I'm getting not paid for this, I'm assuming that we reduced <laughs> quite significantly. <laughs> but, but anyway, I'll finish my thought, which was, um, that uh, there is a harsh reality, I think, of how many people have um, stuff to offer that is, if, if it's mm -hmm. just, I teach this class and I wanna know how I can teach the same class yeah. to people who make money off of that, that is gonna be a difficult thing because unfortunately there's probably hundreds or thousands of other people who teach the same thing. But if it is, I have some unique thing to offer the world that no one yeah. else has to offer, then that is what you know innovation is made of and what you can um, build a brand on. And But if you're teaching the same thing that every other person is teaching in a, in a slightly more interesting way, I'm not sure that that's a moneymaker. I have yeah. to agree. You know, there was uh, somebody on the chat uh, said something about, we have to think about synchronous versus asynchronous delivery. Um, and I think that's really important. I feel like we're sort of mixing all these things up and sort right. of throwing the word online as if it's the same thing as, uh, you know, as, as if it's the same thing as classroom when mm -hmm. really, uh, uh, you know, the class of the discussion section of 10 that is done online versus in a classroom costs pretty much the same to, to make that happen. You know, maybe you don't right. need the room and people don't need to travel, but it's still from a labor, uh, you know, if you have a high cost faculty member from a labor standpoint and 
Um, and I think we can get a lot better about making use of that combination, um, uh, as Professor G said, the hybrid of um, you can do like you can do lectures um, uh, that are that are recorded or that are mass lectures and do discussion sections in, in other kinds of ways. And I think that the current the COVID COVID has opened up those opportunities more just by forcing everyone to learn quickly how to do Zoom and things like that. And I right. think that that's been a positive. Yeah, we've, we've got go ahead. Got you back here. Oh yeah. man, we thought we had we had the rest yeah. of the time ourselves. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah the, qual the quality of the program went up substantially last <laughs> minute. So, <laughs> isn't isn't accreditation really at the end of the day just a weapon of mass entrenchment among people who see a vested interest in maintaining the status quo? And I mean, that's the uh, that's what I believe. The, the The good news is you're starting to see universities that are so desperate for capital, like the University of Pittsburgh, they've partnered with Outlier, which is saying, all right, calculus has been taught the same way for the last hundred years. Calculus is a $7 billion business in the United States, at least calculus courses cost kids $7 billion a year. So we're gonna teach it at 200 bucks. And we've got the University of Pittsburgh to award accreditation or units such that you can transfer into a more expensive university, and arbitrage, almost like what you do with junior college, two years than going into a university. It feels to me like accreditation is nothing more than, you know, a guild. Um, but uh, it, it, do we need accreditation? What, sir, what purpose does it serve? Bob, this is all you. Sure, okay, I'll jump, I'll jump in here and say, you know, I, I have a lot of issues with accreditation, but I think accreditation has been extremely important to this country and extremely important to uh, to higher education, mm -hmm. you know, it, you go out there and you go look at some of the, at least pre-COVID, some of the storefront in colleges that are not accredited. Yep. It is not pretty. Uh, the for-profit schools? Pardon me? You mean mostly the for-profit schools? Well, so, yeah, I mean, they're all, they are often for-profit schools, but a lot of for-profit schools are accredited. It's different accreditors than the ones, it's often different accreditors than the ones that mm -hmm. um, that accredit the traditional colleges and universities. But there's nothing about accreditation that prevents colleges from accepting uh, credits from um, students taking a uh, uh, you know taking courses that have been offered in creative kinds of ways. Um, uh, so I, it's I don't think it's and I think accreditation accreditation has been really important at preventing especially the federal government from asserting direct control over higher education. You're the only thing I, that stops the federal government. It has been the only thing, exactly. And that, and right now with the president we have, we really need accreditation as a, as a separation between, uh, between the federal government saying, you know, here's, here's what it takes to be a, a quality institution um, and instead having it be higher education itself that sets those definitions. There's a lot of flexibility, a lot of things we can improve about it, but I would be really cautious about opening things up. And I would just That's add the point. accreditation in the same way that it doesn't prevent a college from taking credit, it doesn't mean that they have to. So you could be accredited mm -hmm. and you don't they don't have to take, I mean, that's it's a bad side of it, but you know, Harvard and University of Massachusetts are both accredited by the same accreditor. Harvard could say, we don't want to take your credits from UMass, um, even if they're, so that's still their purview. Right. It doesn't solve that problem in the other direction either. That's a good point. All right, next question. I'm a rising sophomore at Mount Holyoke College, and there have been recent reports put out by analysts and professors discussing the future of universities, one being Mount Holyoke College. So my question is if you can provide some advice for those universities on how they can financially survive this pandemic while still providing quality education at a decent price, especially now that we're all online. I think that's become a huge issue. Um, so that and also how universities can support international students more and also middle class families because they tend to get the lower end of the stick. They make enough to send their kid to college but not enough to pay full tuition and yet still don't receive the financial aid they need and often have to struggle to come up with the funds or have to send their child to a cheaper school because the schools don't really have any mercy on us. Zakia, Bob? Goodness, I think um, there are a lot of pieces in there. I'm trying to uh, parse out yeah. um, 
one, I would I will start with the end where she talked about middle income students. And I think a lot of uh, students feel this way. I would say though, um, there's sometimes like a certain, in, unless you're very wealthy, it is hard to pay for college. And I think that's the challenge. And sometimes people see like financial aid going to the poorest kids. It's like, I, even if my family could afford to like get me to college, I wouldn't have rather been, you know, so desperate, destitutely poor that I like needed, you know, a full, a full ride scholarship. I wouldn't have rather had that, you know, that background. It's just the case that I don't have enough to be able to really afford this. So we were really in a situation where the majority of families, can, I um, uh, funded reports when I was at the foundation that showed like how affordable college was and what does it actually mean? And like by any general standard of what you would think is reasonable for people to come out of pocket, um, even if it was, you know, you had to save up for some time, uh, most families cannot afford the average tuition. And I think that is um, when you showed some of the statistics earlier and the pushback you get, I think a lot of colleges want to say that they're affordable and they say, you know, no, you know, it's not sure your tuition isn't everybody's tuition isn't 60,000 or $70,000. But the thing that you have to remember is even if your net tuition and fees and room and board and all of it packed together is really quote unquote only $20,000 or quote unquote only $15,000. Most families in America do not have an extra 15 or $20,000 um, to give. And that's just the stark reality, especially since family incomes haven't really risen um, when you're adjusting for inflation. So that's just, I think we haven't really come to grips with the fact that most people in America cannot afford college. Most people in America don't have enough in their savings account. Most people in America don't have enough to live on if they were to lose their job for six months. Most people in America don't have adequate retirement savings. And so they certainly don't have anything extra after they should have done all those things to help their kids pay for college. And unfortunately, sometimes what they do is they'll cash out their retirement, they'll cash out these other things, they'll forego things to help send their kid to a fancy pants college. Um, and, and that is what's crushing us. So we'd have to have a solution. I don't know. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a solution, but I do just want to acknowledge and I sometimes think that people in higher education want to gloss over the reality that most people can't pay for college. It does feel as if there's a danger zone though. And there's a, so lower income, kids from lower income households faces so many obstacles before they even get to the point of applying to college. But it, it, I would, I, it does feel though, I mean, I was a Pell Grant kid. I applied to school with $38,000 in total household income and the system or UC did a really good job of helping me financially. And I remember some of my peers whose parents made a good living, but not a great living that college seemed to be more of a strain for them because they, they didn't qualify for financial aid. It seems like there's this danger zone in the middle. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the student's question around what can be done, the thing that really disappoints me is if you think about who's taken the hardest hit in terms of industries through COVID-19, it's essentially industries where you consume the product standing or sitting shoulder to shoulder. So restaurants, yeah. sports, hospitality, and education. But if you look at the other industries, they've shown tremendous agility in terms of delivery, remote, apps, and quite frankly, cutting costs. They immediately furloughed people. They immediately fired people. They immediately said, this is our new reality. And my impression of the academic in, uh, kind of industrial complex is we all want to pretend this isn't happening. And we don't want to cut costs. And we want to pretend we want to make strident statements that we're welcoming students back to the campus and everything's going to be the same, send in your tuition checks. We haven't had an honest, open conversation with our, our consumers. If, if, I could, if I could have a wand and say, what should we be doing? I think we should reduce costs 10 to 30% across the board. A crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Every 10 or 20 years, if an industry has to cut costs, it's actually a good thing. We haven't done it in 40 years. And also to go to the parents and say, your kid's experience is going to be impaired. There's no doubt about it. We're cutting tuition by 15, 30, 50 percent. Lean on alumni to help out and have an open, honest conversation. But this, this consensual hallucination that we look forward to welcoming the kids back. And to me, and, and by the way, at, at NYU, we're raising tuition three and a half percent because nothing's wrong. And it just strikes me as every other industry is facing the music. And education isn't. And I, re I think it's only, I think denial is exceptionally expensive and only makes our chin bigger and more easily shattered in the next few weeks. Uh, 
Bob or Anastasia, any thoughts? Well, I mean, I, I, I agree. Although I would say that a lot of schools are furloughing a lot of people right now. So I don't, I don't want the community thinking that, you know, everybody is fully employed in higher ed. A lot of institutions are making really hard choices. I've talked to clients who are trying to decide what percentage of people are going to go on furlough. And that was in April. So it is happening. I will say it tends to be happening at the schools on your list that I, I can't remember the nomenclature now, but are, you know, in the struggle or challenged zone more than I would say NY, the NYUs and, and other institutions. But I think you're right. I mean, I think, you know, like every other industry and look, higher ed doesn't even like to be called an industry. So I have a feeling I'm going to get some pushback and even calling it that um, they're going to have to make some hard choices, whether it's systemic choices or they have to just deal with the current crisis depends on the institution, right? Scott, we've talked about that. Like, you know, the, the schools that are going to thrive may have to do short term cuts, but I don't think they're going to cut their faculty numbers dramatically over over the over the long term. I just don't think that's going to be what their play is. I think other institutions are going to have to make those hard choices um, and really, you know, shrink shrink their size in terms of their administrators and faculty. Bob, any thoughts? I, I agree. There's a lot of uh, denial going on. I think the competitive pressures are really problematic, especially among a lot of the residential colleges where they feel that they will have that decline in enrollment if they don't uh, make if they don't make it seem like they're going to be in person um, when the reality may well be that they cannot be in person and uh, and I'll kind of go back to the antitrust issue the U.S. Department of Justice has been ridiculous over the past couple of decades of preventing colleges from working together to do what's right for students and to do what's right for diversity. And this is a number, another example where they probably would, have, would get in trouble if they tried to get together and say, we're all going online, you know, instead of all of us trying to keep our, you know, let's just all announce that we're online for the coming semester, nobody's going back to school. Yeah, Google's not a monopoly, but but uh, Pitzer is. Um, right. Okay. So next question. Hi, Scott. My name is Amir, and I'm here from San Francisco, California. I was just curious to know what your thoughts are in terms of like opportunities for growth and innovation in higher education. Is it around like obviously fundamentally redesigning the business model? Is it the delivery of education? Is it like? Uh, the social experiences or and so on and so forth. So I'd be grateful if you could provide some uh, context there. Anastasia, I have some thoughts, but why don't you kick us off? Oh yeah, I mean, the thing that that's struck me during this whole conversation is we are really focused in most of our conversation right now uh, about the what most people think of as a college student, right? The 18 to 22 year old who's going to a leafy campus somewhere. Um, but where I think the greatest opportunity and what can really bring the greatest good to, to the American economy and, and uh, is really focused on what higher ed generally calls the non-traditional student, which is defined as either someone who is outside that age band. So let's say a 25 year old, um, someone who already has a family, someone who's working and someone usually who has a few college credits somewhere, but never quite got across the line or only took a semester. I think that's where the opportunity really lies, both in terms of um, increasing access as well as really changing the world and the, the, the economic opportunity for a lot of people. And there are places that are working on that, but they tend to be you know, not well-funded community colleges. Uh, you, know, you can talk about how the state has really withdrawn from that, but there are also some interesting online only uh, places that really focus on that. And they tend to be the ones you see on TV, right? So they're the Southern New Hampshire's, the Western Governors, the Grand Canyons. I think that space is, is an interesting one and one that can do a lot of good. Now, full disclosure, Western Governors, I've worked with them. Um, but, you know, they are, I didn't know this, but they're the number one teacher of science teachers in the country right now. Um, and they're doing it at a remarkably cost-effective way. Right, they had charged 3,500 for six months 
of study and you, as many courses as you can get through during those six months. You know, so th I think there are some real opportunities in this space and I wanna let Scott, but I, I may have taken you off not where you wanted to go, but I think that's something that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of, you know, out of crisis comes a lot of opportunity, hopefully on the public side. I think there's a real big opportunity for public schools to rethink their business model and get back to this notion of much greater uh, admittance rates, uh, educating a lot more students mm -hmm. at a lower price. The, you know, it, it's easy, you see everything through the lens of your own experience. I went to undergrad at UCLA and Berkeley graduate school for a total tuition of $7,000. The reason I'm here, literally the reason I'm here right now is through the generosity and vision and innovation of California taxpayers and the regents of UC. So. Uh, returning to some of that innovation, focusing on our role as public servants, dramatically increasing admit rates and um, uh, um, decreasing costs. I think there's an enormous opportunity to rethink what college should be. Should it be a certification around vocational programming? Uh, there's, you know, as, as, as everything in our society, the people who are really getting kicked in the gut here are middle and lower income people because what universities have had to literally close down the vocational ones, because I can teach brand strategy on Zoom, but it's difficult to teach someone how to weld or how to place a syringe on Microsoft Teams. So, and some vocational schools have been fantastic upward lubricants for kids from lower and middle income households. So more of a European approach to education, I would say. Um, and then in the private sector, there's just going to be extraordinary capital uh, creation here because the, the willingness of students the willingness of parents to uh, pursue lifelong learning, different types of accreditation, different types of certification, and just the ceiling of price that's been set by education has created so much opportunity around being able to come in with a Me Too product. There's, I mean, if I were a young person, there's two industries I'd wanna be looking at right now. I'd wanna look at how technology interfaces with healthcare and how technology interfaces with education. So I think there's tremendous opportunity both in, on the public side and in the private sector. Uh, Zakir, Bob, do you wanna to add to that? Go ahead, Zakir. Um, I would just say um, with a thing that you mentioned about healthcare and higher education, I think actually there are a lot of similarities and I would go back to something you said at the very beginning, which is, um, you know, we have the, some of the best colleges, but I would say to something Bob mentioned, we also have, dare I say, some of the worst um, I guess I haven't traveled everywhere, but it's the same thing with healthcare. We have some of the best healthcare, but some of, unfortunately, the same people, it's lower income people, middle income people, have some of the worst healthcare experiences. They don't get the fancy hospital with all the stuff. The black mothers, you know, in inner cities don't get the maternity ward with all of the birthing center and all of the stuff. And so um, the disparities are very similar in both systems. The payment structures are very, um, they're not they're not always similar, but they have a third party payer problem and they have a very uh, opaque payment structure that has government interference that makes it a very difficult kind of industry to um, reduce cost in. Um, I think healthcare is more confusing than higher ed on that front, which is a hard thing to do, but it's very similar in that we have some of the best, but it obscures the fact that we also have some of the most challenging places and the way to reduce costs in both is really hard because of how the payment structure is uh, situated. Um. Yeah, I think there's big opportunities uh, really in, in every part of higher education. I think some of the designing um, uh, uh, online, inter a the as asynchronous type education, mm -hmm. ways of engaging um, people with different subject areas, um, thinking about it of, of, of ways that uh, people can learn and, and earn that that credit that can be uh, that can be transferred um, is uh, there's a critical need for that, especially for someone who uh, who has a background in technology. Um, and then I would also go to advising. So especially for disadvantaged families, low income communities, uh, they end up being preyed upon by low quality colleges. Um, mostly because the only person they can talk to is the person who ends up being a recruiter for one of those yeah. colleges. There are not advisors they can go to. Rich folks hire, you know, hire these, um, these uh, counselors to help them figure out how to get into an Ivy League school. But when, um, when a low-income family in Pittsburgh is trying to figure out uh, what college can I go to, 
And really they should probably go to the community college down the street that has a great vocational program um, that the, and the person they end up talking to talks them into something to, into a taking out a loan to go to a, a for-profit college doesn't serve them well. And figuring out how to address those advising needs um, would do a great service. All right, let's go to our next question. Hey, do you think income share agreements are gonna be a tool that universities use more and more to try and uh, increase their value proposition uh, for income and students? Uh, so I'll start, I don't like the idea. One of the, one of the problems, and there's no easy way around it, is that anytime you have this type of price inflation, usually cheap credit is at the center of it. And the ability to get these loans sometimes, I don't know if it's a good thing. I think, and I just don't like the idea of indenturing people post. I get the concept. It just makes me physically uncomfortable thinking that someone is going to have a lifelong obligation to pay money back. And especially, it just, it feels uncomfortable for me. The, the thing I do think we need to move to, though, is that universities are responsible for the debt. And that is if, if they can just figure out a way to get accreditation to get the government to give you a loan on something that isn't going to have an NPV on it, that they're on the hook for that, that those default rates. In other words, we need to get universities, I think, totally vested in your success and that ROI on the debt that the student is taking on. But debt plays a strange and uncomfortable role. And not only that, access to debt plays a strange and uncomfortable role in the price inflation we've seen. Um, Zakia or Bob, any thoughts on this? Bob should start. I mean, he has a lot right. of thoughts on income share agreements, so I'll let him start. Yeah, no, I've def I, I definitely agree with, uh, with your concerns uh, uh, the, the, about income share agreements. I mean, in direct response to his question about do I think a lot of universities are going to do this, I actually think they will not. Uh, this has been coming up every few years for the last 50 years, and yeah. it, uh, it ends up getting rejected because there's just too much complication with it. Uh, the, the providers try to claim that it's not a loan, even though it is a loan, and then they violate various rules about loans, and, they, and it, it just is, it's, it ends up being problematic for the provider, um, and it can, and it, and the, the potential for uh, predatory treatment because of uh, uncertainty about future earnings um, is just huge. It's, it's, so it's problematic and, and I don't in, encourage us, you know, I don't encourage a college to go that way or for a student to go that way. I would say that um, in a, a potential way to, that people have thought about, I think people in Congress are thinking about is uh, what's called risk sharing, which Scott kind of just alluded to. I actually don't know where it stands right now, post COVID and everything else in the world. Um, but the idea that colleges should be on the hook in some way for the debt of their students right now, they're, they are tangentially, like if your default rate is something extremely egregious, um, you do have to, um, you know, you, you get kicked out of the whole loan program, but it's not something that's a more, um, a, a more nuanced thing where, you know, if, you know, 10% of the debt that your, your students took on, you know, were to default that you would have any, any obligation for that. Um, so that's a concept that's kind of kicking around that, that I think could get to um, people having some skin in the game is the term that folks use, the college actually having skin in the game around the debt for the college. There's, it's a lot more complicated than that, but I would just note for anyone that's interested that the concept that Scott just mentioned is something that um, has been kicking around and I think is more interesting than the income share agreement piece. Thanks for that. Hi, Professor Galloway. My question is in regards to 529 saving plans. I've been putting away money for my son since before they were born. Now, they are only one and two respectively, uh, so I have a long time to put money away. My question is, is how long do you think this trend of um, higher education reform uh, or even remote learning is going to actually hold? Um, you know, my time horizon is, is 2038. Is everything going to go back to the way it was um, by then? So I should continue to put away as aggressively as possible so that my sons have the opportunity to graduate from college without an overbearing amount of debt? Or should I pull back and um, use that money saving elsewhere? Thanks for your time. 
Bye. All right, thanks for the question. So I can't name anybody who ever looks back and think I fucked up by saving too much. I, I just don't, I, I, look, saving is a wonderful thing. And looking back, if you have too much money in your 529 and you have to pull it out and pay taxes on it, there are worse things that can happen. What, and, and tangibly worse than that is you have to have an uncomfortable conversation with your kids that goes something like this. Congratulations, you've done everything you were supposed to do, but we just can't afford to send you. That's, that is a much bigger downside than, than the downside that you have money growing tax-free in a 529. The only thing I would suggest is you talk to a financial counselor uh, around whether there are better ways to save for college, whether it's a 529 construct or some other tax advantage savings vehicle. But, oh my gosh, uh, good for you. I wish I was thinking your way when I was your age. Uh, I just don't think anybody ever regrets saving, saving too aggressively. Just, I've never heard that before. I saved too aggressively. I've never heard that. Any, any thoughts? The only thing I would say is if they had other, make sure he's like saving for retirement. So if yes. you're saving for 529 and you have, don't have a retirement plan, you should put the money in your retirement plan. And I would take care, you know, put your own seatbelt on before you put the ox or put your own oxygen mask on before you put on someone else's. Great point, Bob. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Maximize your retirement savings. You cannot borrow for retirement. You can borrow for college. Um, and, uh, and certainly maximize retirement savings before, uh, putting money into a 529. I also want to make sure to the extent that there are any uh, lower income families um, uh, who, who are listening to, to, to this, uh, that the fact that you maybe have not been able to put money into 529 does not mean that you're not going to be able to find good college options. So I don't want people to feel like, because uh, most people don't have 529 plans, um, uh, or if they do, there's very little money in it. And, um, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are ways to pay for, for college um, and lower cost colleges. And, uh, and many of them are very, very high quality with very committed teachers. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, certainly if you're, um, uh, you know, the, a lot of the talk about 529s is mostly much higher income people obsessed with uh, the Ivy League kinds of schools, um, and that's not most of America. Hi, Professor Galloway. I work for a study abroad company and believe that international experience is essential to having a complete education. Assuming that the virus is defeated and that Americans are actually allowed to travel internationally again, what, what do you think students, parents, and the schools themselves will think of study abroad as part of the post COVID higher ed experience. Thanks a lot. Love the show. Anastasia, any thoughts on this one? Yeah, I mean, again, there's a couple of assumptions in there. And I, and I do think eventually <laughs> the COVID will, will be defeated and we will be able to get on planes uh, again and, and travel, let's hope. Um, I think, again, it depends about what part of higher ed you're talking about. So I don't want to make a general statement, but I think that it's gonna come back will be my take. Um, I do think that they're, especially at, let's call them elite or sort of elite institutions, there is a real push for a uh, global experience. And at least the students I talked to all wanted to go abroad for at least a semester. So I don't see that disappearing um, at all. I don't know what anybody else thinks, but, I, I, I think there may be some fear for a couple of years, you know, nervousness about whether your kid can get back and, and that kind of thing. But I think long-term, it'll return. Uh, Zakir, Bob? I think people are chomping at the bit to get out. Um, <laughs> and, the, and that when things open up, when they can travel um, and uh, that, that they will. So I, I think study abroad will come back and maybe even bigger than it ever was. Which if anyone great. lets Americans back into their countries. Yeah, exactly. If we can, <laughs> yes. if, we're, if, we're, if we're safe to them. <clears throat> yeah, I just, uh, it just strikes me as, and maybe things have changed, but study abroad to me always was kind of, oh, you know, when I heard about my friends going to, my roommate in the fraternity went to semester at Cena, I'm like, oh, you're rich. Like, it, that just wasn't an option studying abroad. Like, I would have loved to have gone to Florence, but it wasn't even, it wasn't even in my selection set. And it's still, it still strikes me as study abroad and maybe things have changed. It's kind of the playground for rich kids, but it's a wonderful thing. I, you can't argue with it. And I'm sure 
I'm sure people are still going to want to travel. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure it's it's. Uh... Although it's it's funny, Scott. For some some programs, it's actually cheaper than your home institution to go abroad for a semester. I actually know students who who go, and they choose their location partially based on how much cheaper it would be than their home institution. So it does depend. There is some arbitrage going on by students who pick who pick a place because it's cheaper than their home institution. I thought I always thought the arbitrage was done by NYU, where we send you to uh, Institute to Impress, uh, pay a lower fee, and still start charge the same tuition. <laughs> that's uh, the that's the that's versus the, okay. the less savvy institutions. I would say I think the the um, average student who has the uh, cultural capital and the wherewithal to even do the is going to be higher income than the person who's like, okay, I just can't do that. I went to college on a scholarship and part of, and I went to Vanderbilt, one of the fancy colleges we mentioned earlier on a, on a scholarship. And it included a scholarship that had money for study abroad. And had it not had that, I wouldn't have done this. Study abroad. It's, I think that's a very unique thing. And I still think the major the minority of, of the millions of students in America, 22 million students in higher education, the minority of them are doing um, study abroad because uh, of the reasons that, that Professor Galloway mentioned. Okay, so I, I have a couple of questions for the panel. I have an 18 year old who's got, in, got into a good school. It's gonna cost, you know, room and board 50, 60 K, maybe some financial aid, some loans, but it's gonna cost our family 40 K. We make a good living, but we're not rich. And Tulane is saying, or whoever it is is saying, it's going to be all online. Do they take sick? Do they take the fall semester off, or do we pay the twenty or thirty grand for them to take Zoom classes from from what's now my office and used to be the kids' bedroom? Okay, thanks very much. <laughs> I, I, I am going to not answer just because we have colleges in New Jersey. I would say um, I don't have any uh, children of my own yet. We'll have one uh, soon and then, you know, 18 or so years from then. Um, so I could say what I would do and what my parents did, but my parents were very... Uh, uh, different kind of parents. I got into a bunch of colleges, thank goodness. And um, they were they were the ones that said, you know, hey, we don't have any money for you to go to college. I mean, we weren't like, we weren't poor, we were middle class, and I don't know what they did with their money. I think they're fantastic parents. They were just like, yeah, we went to college on scholarship, so you should figure out where you're going to go on scholarship too. And, um, and so I think they're always, there are a lot lower cost options than Tulane. Tulane is a great school. I am, have no doubt that they have tried to improve their online offerings since the spring. Hopefully they have spent all summer improving the quality of that online. But I would say I know that in New Orleans, there are a number of public colleges and community colleges that may offer the same introductory content. And I would see about um, whether in general, whether it was, this is frankly advice I always give to people, whether it's a pandemic or not, that um, there's a lot of, again, it gets to what are you getting from the name brand? Is it really, all of that, or are there other options that you could get the same content from um, and get the same outcome? So it's a personal decision based on whatever you think, but I, there are certainly ways to get the freshman year educational content for far cheaper than $30,000. Zakia, you have a bright future in politics. Um, <laughs> well done, well done. Uh, Bob or Anastasia, any so, thoughts? I might as well take the, uh, you know, Zia, Zakia kind of, uh, I'd say, leaned it in, while well, she didn't take a position, she kind of leaned it in the direction of, there are some cheaper options. So uh, let me go the other direction to say that, you know, look, if you're, if, if you've basically raised your kids with the idea that, you know, okay, we're going to spend quarter of a million dollars for you to go to uh, uh, a fancy elite school. And here's the one you got into and the, um, and the class of whatever we're, we're in now, 2024, um, you know, there's a lot to, uh, this is not the way I went to college, but there's a lot to like being a part of that class and having the experience that that class of students had as freshmen and all the way through. And um, if you kind of put the money out there, the, the school's going to be putting a lot of money and time and effort to try to figure out how do we make this an okay experience. And it will be different from anything that's ever happened at the college before, and they will be able to be a part of that experience. And so give it a shot. And um, maybe the next semester or next fall, they'll then have the residential experience with these people that they only knew 
online. So, you know, I, don't, I think they're both perfectly fine decisions as long as you're fine with spending the money on the uh, what might be uh, low quality and disappointing education, but an interesting experience nonetheless. Yeah, I mean, I think it also depends on what your options are in terms of like, can you take, will they let you defer? Or is this your one shot to get into this particular school? And how much does that matter to you? I mean, there are so many factors that go into this. I wouldn't want to tell any given individual a blanket statement. But I do think, you know, and I've talked to some people, some people have gotten into schools that they never thought they could have gotten into this past admission cycle and they are all in because they don't want to give up that opportunity right and i'm not saying that's right or that's wrong but i really think you have to think about that as well if this is your one shot and tulane is your dream school and i'm sorry we're using tulane um but whatever the school is that might be worth it um but on the same but I also agree with yeah, there are plenty of lower cost options as long as you think you're going to do well enough at that place to get the opportunity to get into such a school. Because I do think, given the way students are reacting, and I'm hearing this all over, returning students are, even if their school is not open, they are moving back to that school city. Supposedly, the real estate market right around Wash U, right around the DC universities, you cannot get an apartment because so many students are trying to get there and they're setting up their own pods and setting up their own cohorts and, and they want to be with each other in, in a setting. So, you know, if this is your shot, I'm not sure you're going to get that shot again next year. I would just say, in general, my advice to people is not to um, not to have a dream school. And I just this is well, right. Again, yeah. <laughs> again, I don't have kids, so I've never had to say that to somebody. Right. But I just say, like, if you're if you're set on going to one place, that one yeah. place, and you're yeah, you're or have multiple dream schools, right? They can have you by the yeah. cojones, and you can't choose anywhere else. So if you're open right. to a bunch of different places, that's in general life. Right. If you're, you're buying something, if it's like you have to have this or have nothing else, else, and schools know how to determine, they have algorithms to determine whether you are willing to pay $35,000 or $30,000 yes. or $40,000 based on how many other schools you apply to, the kinds of other schools you apply to. So the more you're actually open to saying, it doesn't matter um, if I go to this school or that school or whatever, mm -hmm. um, the, the more you have a, a leg up in there. Yeah, and and I totally agree that the distinguishing characteristics between a lot of universities, you know, you get in your head where you want to go as a kid. It, the, there is no, there isn't that big a difference between a lot of the places we're talking about, right? Especially, so I agree with you. So I'm not suggesting you should do it. I'm just telling you what I'm hearing in the market from a lot of people, a lot of leaders. I would, educational I would just, institutions. I would point out though that, okay, so UCLA Cal, Anastasia, you went to Princeton, right? Yes. And Zakia, you went to Vanderbilt. Bob, where'd you go to school? I graduated from Berkeley, but started at University of Oregon. Okay, so uh, we have all went to, you know, tier one schools. And I find that when people start recommending that they look into lower cost options, it's usually from people who went to tier one schools. I, I still think economically, the parent, until it's your kid, the parent figures out a way. Unfortunately, That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying don't have, you know, I have, have multiple to, dream schools. I think that's smart. Don't, yeah. don't get hung up yeah. on any one. That's, that's what, that's what my advice that's is. That's recipe to get rejected. That's recipe to get your yes. heart broken. It's yes. almost as if that school senses that you just want them and they reject. That's what I mean. That's what yeah. I mean. If it's, you, yeah. It's crazy. Unfortunately though, I, I do think we live in a bit of a caste system where the, that brand is just so important that parents ultimately end up deciding to go to whatever is the best brand, as Anastasia said, as, as indicated by US News and World Report, which has become this incredibly powerful arbiter. So right. I want- but, but brand drives so much of what human beings do. I think you know, not recognizing that is also potentially dangerous, right? I mean, Scott, you do this all the time. You talk about luxury branding and luxury, right? And how much human beings are driven by that and by status. Yeah. Why would we expect human beings to act differently when it comes yeah. to higher education, which is a lifetime brand that you get to yeah. wear if you graduate. So I also think not understanding human psychology and behavior around this stuff, we're not that 
different when it comes to higher ed as it comes to, and I don't want to compare it to, you know, to a Lamborghini or whatever, but you know, yep, yep. yep. it's there. It is a yeah. high, it is a high class problem though. Yes. Yep. Um, because yep. the majority of people in America who graduate with a four-year degree graduate from colleges that we've never heard of. They're not even exactly. your state colleges. They are the they are the King Universities, they are the Montclair State Universities, they are the Georgia yeah. States, not the University of Georgia or the Georgia Techs. They are the Georgia Southerns and you know West Georgia State University. So I just want to acknowledge that. And they are great, and they fuel great like that cool. our middle class is made up of people who went to colleges like that. Yeah, yeah. Many, many executives of big companies, that's where they went to school. So uh, it's not even that you can't uh, enter the elite and make a lot of money in life uh, from a college like that. So to, to end, I want, I want you guys to think about this. I'm going to make a couple of predictions, and I would like each of you to make a couple of predictions about higher ed. So my first prediction is that we're going to have hundreds of universities begin this death march. I think that the cartel of higher ed increasing prices with no underlying increase in innovation, the cost structure, the Rolexification of the campuses, um, I think in this, this new, if you will, recognition that there are other paths or at least being open to other paths is going to result in, call it the tier three universities being thrust into just utter chaos. And I, it feels like it's been happening for a while, but it's about to accelerate. I love that Larry Sumner's quote that it's surprising how long things take and then shocking how fast they can happen. I think we're about to enter the shocking phase of higher ed. And then my second prediction is that um, we're going to have numerous universities uh, after an outbreak decide to send their kids home. I, I think that, uh, and I'm not asking any of you, I'm not an epidemiologist, but that's not going to stop me from talking about things that involve epidemiology. I think that the risks that uh, universities are taking with a cohort that has proven to be super spreaders in a high density, in a, in a product, in a social atmosphere that is high density with a cohort that for tens of thousands of years has been taught this is the time in their life they're supposed to be doing anything but distancing, uh, that we are just begging disaster around so, some of these smaller college towns. So in sum, destruction and disease are my two predictions. Anastasia, you're up. Happy, 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 Scott. Man, um, I think there will be disruption, but you know maybe it's the historian in me, um, you know, when Gutenberg came out with the printing press, universities were in full panic mode that their business model, and they didn't call it a business model, was gonna be destroyed because content could now be read by a much larger percentage of the population and content could be distributed, right? It didn't happen. So I don't saying we're in the same position. I think COVID is gonna push schools that were already in severe trouble over the edge. Yep. That is clear. How many? Not quite sure. Um, I think what will happen is the strongest schools are going to separate themselves even more. Yeah. Um, and I think state universities are going to be in a real crunch because of, you know, I think given tax revenues, it's going to come down again, their, their contributions from states. And I think they actually could be the most interesting places in terms of innovation. And if more places go do, let's say, like the Penn State Online, University of Maryland Global Campus, I think those are the places where you're going to see a push. But I think more places are going to survive than, than most people think. Maybe I'm Pollyannish, which no one has ever called me, but I'm going to be that today. Zikia? And the super spreaders, I don't know what to say about. I mean, yeah. I think that's I am, really I'm tough. very concerned about the health impacts of yep. um, the virus, especially with what we know about um, who's most spreading, um, which is right now younger student, younger people in general who are congregating together. I'm very worried about what Anastasia just said about students who, whose classes are online, whose schools have said that it's not safe to be in person together, and they are still coming and trying to figure out how to, and I get the human connection por portion, portion of that, which makes combating the virus so hard, um, but it really does worry me about how we can uh, fend this off in the long term. So this is like a statement about health and less about higher education, but it concerns me greatly. And I think the colleges that aren't thinking 
about every aspect of how to use all of their resources to encourage students not to do things that spread. So you need to be having an orientation that gives people education and knowledge about like how the virus is spread and what you should be doing to prevent your, yourself. You need to be giving them orientation kits that have masks and encouraging masking um, from my other like non higher ed hats. Now um, that stuff does, does worry me a great deal if we're not doing the appropriate things to protect. So I will just end on, on that note that um, I think we do have some doom and gloom in our future and folks that if are not kind of savvy to that or not accepting reality about um, what may happen when people begin to gather will have to close um, once they have a lot of uh, spread on their campuses. It's just, it just strikes me, you know, every unhealthy attribute of America, whether it was income inequality where systemic racism is really coming to a head here. All of those trends are leaping 10 years. I, you know who I think is most vulnerable is if you think about kids who go to college, loosely speaking, they're middle and upper income kids or they're disproportionately middle and upper income. And then you think about the support staff, think about the people in restaurants serving all these kids who tend to be middle income, lower income and older. I mean, they're the ones we're putting at risk. You know, most, most a 19 year old gets a headache or typically, right? It just, it feels like some of these small towns where their population is going to swell or double in a matter of eight days. Uh, gosh, I just, it just feels, it feels like the opening scene to Contagion too. Bob? Uh, I think you're absolutely right on, on that. Um, and then on the financially struggling schools, I think, I think the number of schools that we will see close in the next year or so will probably be in the triple digits. Um, I think we can't say, I don't, I don't think there's any formula to tell us exactly which ones it will be. There are so many um, variables. Um, and I think, but though from a student perspective, I'm thinking back to the Mount Holyoke question uh, earlier, that if you're attending a respectable college, you shouldn't worry too much about the potential for closure because yeah. uh, it's a respectable school, even if it does close or merge the units will transfer, you'll be okay. Okay, Bob Chairman, Zakia Smith Ellis, Anastasia Crosswhite, thank you so much for your participation today. Thanks to everyone for, for um, dialing in or, or for zooming in. This is obviously a very nervous and um, tense and stressful time. We hope you are well. The one thing, another thing I would, um, offer is that I think the debate we're having here is uh, different and should not be conflated with the K through 12 debate. Uh, I think this debate around college uh, is a, a, a meaningful disappointment for a lot of kids, but I think the K through 12 debate is a profound, has a profound impact on households. And that's an entirely different calculus. And I wouldn't want anyone to, uh, here to construe our comments as having uh, some sort of blanket viewpoint on K through 12. That's a different talk show. So with that, with the fine print, uh, if you want more information or you want to go, if you want to, um, if you, you want to uh, download the, the sheet, please go to profgalloway.com. If we can be helpful, please send an, an email. Uh, I'm pretty easy to track down uh, or send one uh, to the Prof, Prof Galloway site, but we appreciate your time. We hope you and your kids are safe. We look forward to getting back to a state of normalcy where we can all spill into adulthood and safe and joyous places and get our hearts broken and have those hearts heal stronger uh, and find wonder in things we had no, no idea we'd have any interest in and uh, go to great football games and see fall unfold before our eyes. That was not very poetic, but regardless, we appreciate your time. Uh, stay safe. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care. Uh, thank you.